many minutes or hours a day are you on your mobile phone? Do you use a headset or hold it close to your ear? Do you keep it in a pocket for easy reach? And do you ever think about what it could be doing to your health? Our guest tonight says you should. Dr. Deborah Davis is an epidemiologist and founding director of the Toxicology and Environmental Studies Board at the United States National Academy of Sciences. She's written a new book called Disconnect, the truth about mobile phone radiation, what the industry has done to hide it and how to protect your family. Deborah Davis joined me from Washington earlier. Deborah Davis, welcome to Late Line. Thank you. The cover of your book states categorically that as research scientists are now demonstrating, mobile phone radiation can damage the human body's cells. And yet, in the first few pages, you write, neither the danger nor the safety of cell phones is yet certain. Why the apparent contradiction? Well, I think there's a lot of legitimate complexity to the science, and I think industry has done a good job of magnifying that complexity, so people are terribly confused about it. But the bottom line is a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio and should not be held next to the brain or close to the body. What's convinced you? What evidence do you point to? Well, I think some of the most compelling evidence actually comes from Australia, from the laboratory of John Aitken, who has shown that sperm from healthy men, when split into two samples, will die three times faster and have three times more damage on the DNA of the sperm after exposure to cell phone radiation. Uh, other work uh, has been done also in Australia by uh, surgeons uh, Vinnie Karuna and Charlie Teo, who have uh, looked at all of the world's literature on this subject and concluded that on average people who use cell phones heavily unfortunately have a doubled or greater risk of brain cancer overall. And then finally, there's the work of uh, Bruce Armstrong, among others, looking at large s studies done over time in 13 different countries, which also confirm the views of Drs. Corona and Teo that long-term regular use of cell phones puts one at risk uh, of brain cancer. A couple of points there. First, the study involving 13 countries. There was the World Health Organization's Interphone study, which was over a number of years and, as we said, involved more than a dozen countries. That study determined that overall there was no increase in risk of glioma, in other words, brain cancer, with the use of mobile phones. They did say it requires further investigation, but uh, more investigation is a lot different to saying big risk, isn't it? Well, let me point something out to you. That study defined a user as someone who made one call a week for six months. I don't know about you, but I certainly use my phone more than that. And the average user in that study hadn't used a cell phone very long. Very recently, two of the leaders of that study have broken ranks from that conclusion. Dr. Sigal Sadetsky and Elizabeth Cardis, who originally was the director of the entire Interphone study, have just published an analysis where they say that while more studies are always needed, and I certainly agree we need more data, at this point, they think it would be imprudent not to take precautionary actions based on what they have observed, which is, as I noted, a doubled or greater risk of brain tumors with long-term cell phone users. And remember this, the Interphone study did not analyze data that they still have on tumors of the cheek and tumors of the hearing nerve. And there again, several studies in a number of countries, Israel and Japan among them, have found a doubled or greater risk of tumors on the hearing nerve and tumors in the cheek associated with long-term cell phone use. So I do think that at this point it's appropriate to take precautionary action because brain cancer can take 40 years to develop in a population that's been exposed. We know that because it took 40 years after the bombings that ended World War II before we saw a measurable, significant increase in brain cancer in the general population in Japan. Is that why, when you look at the studies, even going as far back as the mid-80s, when mobile phone use became more common, the rates of brain cancer have been pretty constant? Is that how you explain that? Exactly. And by the way, in the mid-80s, uh, fewer than 3% of all people in most of our countries were using cell phones. But you fast forward to today, when almost 100% of people are using cell phones. And in Australia, you have more than one phone for every person. Some people have two or three phones. So the situation right now today is radically different than in the 1980s or 1990s or even at the beginning of this decade. What about the Danish study? of 2006, which is cited by many. More than 420,000 mobile phone users were followed for more than 21 years and no evidence was found of tumour risk with phone 
use. Would you say that's another case of, of not enough time and not enough usage? Oh, two things. I think that's well said. Not enough time, not enough usage. But what the average user in that study had used a cell phone for eight years. Again, we know that it's seems to be 10 years or more that triggers this measurable increase in risk. But there's something else that's very important to understand about that study. That study actually started out with 700,000 cell phone users, mobile phone users. And they excluded 200,000 people because they were business users of mobile phones. So they excluded the people that might have been the biggest users, the heaviest users. They then looked at the remaining group and asked whether there was any measurable increase in brain tumors that had occurred in a period of time that included 20 years, but very few people in their study had actually used a cell phone for more than um, 10 years. Now, here's the problem. They looked at less than a million people. The rate of brain cancer in the general population is, say, four to five per 100,000. So you need a, to observe many millions of people in a large population over a long period of time before finding anything at all. And as you pointed out before, we just don't have enough time to observe all of that. That's why in my book, Disconnect, I talk about what we know experimentally. And what we know experimentally is if you take radio frequency radiation from a cell phone and expose it to brain cells in a culture uh, in the laboratory, you can actually measure markers of damage to those brain cells just like that which we see with cancer. If the evidence is so clear, why is it that no less an authority than the World Health Organization says that the current evidence does not confirm the existence of any health consequences from exposure to low-level electromagnetic fields. And indeed, that's a finding that's echoed by other public health organizations. Well, actually, the World Health Organization has said that low-level electromagnetic fields are a suspect cause of cancer in humans, the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And in May, they're going to be reviewing the evidence on um, mobile phone radiation as well, which is a form of radio frequency radiation. Uh, in fact, it is difficult to view the evidence, and the World Health Organization tends to focus predominantly on human studies. And as we indicated in the beginning, if you focus only on cancer, I think you're missing an important part of the equation. That's why the work on sperm count and male health is so important. John Aiken's work in Australia has been matched by work by the director of the Cleveland Clinic, Professor Ashok Agarwal, one of the world's most distinguished experts in this field, and by work by the laboratory of Lucas Margaritis in Greece and by the Medical University in Turkey, all of those laboratories working totally independently of one another have shown markers of damage on the DNA of sperm, have shown a production of free radicals, which are damaging agents in the blood. And those together, I think, indicate that we've got real reason for concern, which is why the Israeli government, the Finnish government, the French government, and the British government have all issued precautionary statements of various sorts. In fact, in France, right now, it will be illegal to sell a cell phone for the use of a child under the age of 12. Wouldn't you imagine, though, that that in itself would be enough for the WHO and other organizations to issue stronger warnings? I think they will be doing that soon. I've been in contact with senior officials there and a number of other nations that are very concerned about this because the issue with cell phones is not that hard. It's not that we tell people you shouldn't use them, but you need to use them safely, which means use a headset, use a speakerphone, don't keep the phone on your body. Be smart and sensible with how you use a phone. And don't give a phone to a child to use without a headset or a speakerphone. Children should be encouraged to text and not talk on a phone. And all of us should think twice before keeping a phone close to the head or close to the body. And if you take the steps that you recommend, does that reduce the risk or remove it? Well, you know, there's no such thing as a life without risk. And I think phones today are like cars and guns and alcohol. They're things that we've become quite accustomed to. They have valuable roles in our society, but we've got to be smarter about how we use them. Remember when we didn't have airbags or seat belts and when we weren't quite aware of the needs to take precautions in the way we drove? That's where we are with cell phones today. And we've got to take a step back and be sensible to understand that there are safer ways to use cell phones, and that's why we're launching the global campaign for safer cell phones. Given the uncertainty, while you might argue the absence of proof doesn't equal proof of safety, you go a step further. You warn of a public health catastrophe. Is that not alarmist? Well, you know, 
l let me explain where I'm coming from. I worked at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences for 10 years, and in that capacity as director of one of their large boards, I oversaw the evaluation of the evidence on passive smoke and, sm and tobacco and asbestos. And in those instances, we looked at the data and we said, well, we're not sure, we think there could be a problem. And while we waited and continued to evaluate the issue, unfortunately, millions of people were exposed, and you in Australia now are just starting to recover from the epidemics associated with tobacco and asbestos. In this situation with cell phones, I don't think we want to wait. That's why I've written my book. That's why I've taken a step outside of the traditional academic role here to say, look, we can be sensible about this. Let's take these precautions now. We're going to be better off, and my children and grandchildren will be better off as well. I recognize we don't have definitive proof in terms of human harm, but from where I sit, as someone who has evaluated evidence for governments around the world on tobacco and asbestos, we have plenty of good, solid reasons for concern, and there are simple things we can do to protect ourselves, so let's just do it. You say not definitive proof, but in fact you're implying a cover-up, aren't you? You write that the existence of scientific conflict on this subject is in large part a reflection of the successful efforts of some to manufacture scientific doubt. Well, I think the documentation on that is pretty clear. It's in my book. It's in the work of, of uh, Dr. Donald Meish uh, in Australia as well, where we trace the paper trail and trace the money trail. One example that will be in my new afterword that is not out yet is that in 1994, when scientists first reported in a scientific meeting that cell phone radiation could damage the DNA inside the nucleus of the brain of rats, those scientists were treated the following way. First, the journal that accepted their paper was asked to unaccept it. Then their university was asked to fire them. Then the agency that funded them was asked to defund them. And when all of that failed, then the company hired a public relations firm to, quote, war game the science. And all of that is documented and will be in the afterword to my book as well. So this war game strategy is what industry did in the 1990s. And remember, in the 1990s, we didn't even have a cell phone in, in, in every house, in every person. That would imply, wouldn't it, that the WHO and the other public health organizations that say there's no risk are part of the same conspiracy, and where's their incentive to hide the facts? You know, I don't think it's such a simple thing as a conspiracy. Look, cell phones are very convenient. We want to believe that they're going to be safe. I myself started out when writing this book years ago, I had three phones. I thought the people were concerned about this were, were ridiculous. And I learned I was wrong. I learned that Sir William Stewart in Britain in the year 2000 headed up a commission for the government, for the Royal College of Physicians, and concluded that based on what he knew then, it would be prudent for teenagers not to use cell phones. And by the way, the British health authorities have recently reaffirmed that view in a pamphlet that you can find uh, from our website. So I don't think it's a matter of a simple conspiracy. Science is more complicated than that. And we become scientists because we like to argue and we like to look at details and nuance. And there are legitimate uncertainties and questions that can be raised by reasonable people. I think what's happened in this situation is the industry has taken some advantage of the inherent tendencies of scientists to get into arguments with one another magnified that, exaggerated uncertainties, which are legitimate, and as a bottom line consequence, the public is terribly confused, which I understand. Certainly, plenty of food for thought. Deborah Davis, many thanks for joining Lateline. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.